What a tremendous honor it is to be reading in this august establishment and to be paired with the incomparable Stephen Milhauser, whose narrative ledger domain makes every page in sorceling. My gratitude to all who braved the rain to be here tonight and to Bernard Schwartz, who curates this extraordinary series, The Fairy Godfather I Didn't Know I Had, and to Susan Bell, whose readership has sustained me through the years and whose editorial eye I covet. Your introduction means the world to me, Susan. I will be reading you tonight from a novel in progress that has for a number of years been a novel in stasis over which I have labored for at least a decade. It's set in the uh, 1960s and 70s on Long Island in the melting pot era, and it concerns female protag the female protagonist's lack of ease about her Italian-American identity and the Catholic single-sex education to which her parents have subjected her. They have also subjected her to an embarrassingly long name with six syllables and seven vowels, and this to her mind is a preposterous name, Posta Della Fuoco, I tried to make it as preposterous as I could, and it's perpetually vexing to her. Her first name is Virginia, for reasons that will become obvious over 500 pages. Don't worry, I'm only reading 15 tonight. Uh, and they'll be broken into two sections. The first is called Back to the Garden, and the second is entitled Her Lady's Mouth. There's actually a metafictional play with more realist sections and a whole structure that involves the 1964 World's Fair and Pompeii antiquity, but you're not gonna get much of that in these pages, but just trust me that there's kind of a complex thing behind all this. So may I ask first if I am audible? Because you are not visible, so I have to assume that uh, you're telling me the truth. So this is Back to the Garden. Thousands and thousands of young people blend into one body. This malleable landscape of flesh raises thousands of hands, each index and middle finger held high in a V, no longer the symbol of victory, but of peace. From the stage, Country Joe speaks the language of the middle finger minus its neighboring forefinger, not to condemn or dismiss, but to celebrate, eliciting from the crowd a selective alphabet far more ecstatic than the call and response one might hear during the prayers of the people at Sunday Mass, well before the kiss of peace. That same weekend, in fact, Margaret Kinsella, Janie Salerno, Don Krotowski, Victoria Murphy, Virginia, and Angela Posta Della Fuoco, and the vast majority of the girls who attend St. Rose recite the Nicene Creed, the Our Father, the Eucharistic Prayer, as well as the Responsorial Psalms. Whether in their respective parishes or a church they see only in August, they will dutifully pray for the Pope, the President, the Bishop, the clergy, the army, and every civilian, including the poor and the sick and the lonely, every congregation soliciting God's ear, Lord, hear our prayer, Lord, hear our prayer, Lord, hear our prayer. The drone begins Saturday evening at 5 and resumes Sunday at 8, 10, 11, 30, 12, 45, and again at 5. Just as banks and grocery stores have extended their hours, so too has the ever more flexible Vatican II Catholic Church. But two and a half hours north in the Catskills, the three-day-long festival has become as if a temporal version of the bodies crammed into it a single, contiguous entity, and its jubilant mimicking din drowns out all the distant sotto voce incantations, matching them syllable for syllable, transforming entreaty into command. Give me an F, shouts Country Joe into the crowd, and hundreds of thousands of people reciprocate. F, give me a U, give me a C, give me a K. What's that spell, Country Joe McDonald asks his electrified audience. And through their collaborative fervor, those four infamous letters inscribe themselves into the mellow ambience of folk music, pot smoke, and anti-establishment goodwill. For whom, meanwhile, do the girls at St. Rose most fervently pray? huddled in pews, safe under roofs, assembled not in a single vast open air congregation, but in scattered locations across the island and beyond, for the poor, the sick, and for those who are alone. They know they should not put themselves in this category. They're too young to have boyfriends, and besides, that is not how the church defines alone. Being a member of the Catholic Church, Mrs. Posta Della Foco believes, and has repeatedly told her daughters, means never having to be alone, even if poor, even when sick. She would not likely acknowledge that 120 miles away at Yasger's farm, an alternate church has evolved overnight in the form of a thousand-armed Shiva-like body. 
nor would she likely perceive this unwieldy but functional body as the picture of health. And yet this appears to be the case, accepting a lack of some basic supplies, sanitary napkins and aspirin and soap, and of course the anomalous bad trip, there are no complaints. There is certainly no loneliness. Money is irrelevant, as somewhere along the line, due to its ever-expanding corpus, a benign version of the Posta della Foca girl's favorite horror movie, The Blob, the festival has become free of charge. Thus, no one need pay for the delectable taste of the zeitgeist forbidden fruit, and no one need pray for the soon-to-be legendary self-sufficient squatters of Yasker's farm. Like a game board spinner, the spun bottle spout directs the placement of tentative, perfunctory kisses. Who knows who you'll get to kiss? So you've got to be brave, you can't be picky. Submit to the beauty of randomness. With so many fewer boys than girls, of course, the bottle sometimes has to spin more than once in a single turn, if, for instance, a girl landed on a girl. When the children are finally dizzy from spinning, the class is promoted to training wheel strip poker. Not to worry, each token removal is barely perceptible to the naked eye, as if the subtle rotation of some distant planet. Take off your glasses, unlace a shoe. You've got another few moves before having to tug off a sock. Unfasten a button, the top one, just one. Then pull that leather snake from its fabric loops. Unbuckle it first, silly. There is so much peripheral forfeit before getting down to the nitty gritty. Sorry there, Dunlop, taking your handkerchief out of your pocket is not a legitimate move. Clearly, no one expects, or for that matter, wants any grand sweeping gesture. They're not even 13, after all. And for this crowd, it doesn't take much ammunition to be provocative. One detail should not be left out, however. The context of this forbidden game, much like its mechanism, is chance. While serving ice cream and cake, Lorraine's mother began to act strangely, her head moving back and forth like a stuck wind-up toy. Lorraine, apparently having encountered the situation before, immediately takes charge, saying, let's get you upstairs, Mom, let's get you some rest. And now the mysteriously out of commission Mrs. Del Vecchio has been given equally mysterious medication and been taken to her bed. A disorder, Lorraine calls it, and Virginia Posta Della Fuoco tries to envision the chronically messy state of her own room transported into a head or a body. She has never been in a situation where a mother is incapacitated and without question won't be coming down to provide or to spy. No one refers to it, but everyone is aware of it. And since it isn't exactly an emergency, just a situation, this unseating of authority does not merit phone calls to two dozen parents, all of whom promise to pick up their children at five o'clock, whereas now it is only three. A motherless party is a party officially over. Unofficially, however, it's just begun. That is why on this particular Saturday, at this particular party, there is a window of freedom, which even in the physically windowless basement of the Del Vecchio house, opens just wide enough to see a peripheral glimpse of the so near and yet so far Yasker's farm. This window of opportunity from the soon-to-be eighth graders' vantage is a bit like the Red Sea parting to let the Israelites across because God preferred to work with the tools at hand, with nature, that is, rather than crafting a miracle from scratch, although Sister Cordelay and Father Connolly would dispute this interpretation, deeming it self-serving and even sinful. Do you know what the word sophistry means? Surely you see, boys and girls, that this circumstance is just the opposite of the miracle of the Red Sea, because the devil would be delighted to endorse any casual arrangement whereby sickness and suffering make room for sin, even if only venial sin. And the chastened pupils would hang their heads, ashamed of their unintended wickedness, though during the, five, the latter five of the ten Hail Marys of their assigned penance, they would find themselves trying to gauge the relative wrongness of one opened button or unbuckled belt. For it seems to them that even cumulatively, their token disrobing or smooching gestures would register less on a scale of indiscretion than Len Whiting's indecent exposure as Romeo, less than the Coppertone girls, for that matter, her pale buttock exposed by a mischievous dog who cleverly tugged at her bathing suit bottom, thereby displaying the depth of her product-assisted tan. As they progress through the years to come, some of the girls of St. Rose will decide that this is precisely the problem with adults, with parents and nuns and parish priests so stuck on decency they tended to miss the essence of things. 
Len Whiting offered his flesh to the camera, acting as Romeo, whose mortal sin wasn't making love, since he made it in wedlock, but courting death for love's sake. In exchange, he gained the right to share eternity, and eternal damnation, presumably, with his beloved. To any romantic girl, this was a dynamic, not static, even if tragic, afterlife. Whereas the Coppertone girl, emblem of innocence, sporting youthful blonde pigtails and clueless expression, was doomed to be pestered into eternity, never permitted to graduate from frisky dog to frisky man, meaning frisky fiance, of course, exposed on a million billboards as a classic case of arrested development, thus frozen into the very definition of a young lady. When in later years, Sister Catherine John schools them in ancient myth, they will see Romeo as Orpheus, and when they progress to Sisyphus, some of the girls will remember a girl trapped in cuteness via the jaws of a dog, locked in position, unable to move forward. And that's the end of that first section. Thank you. Thank you much, and I will speed on to the second section, which is, uh, I will give you an excerpt of as well, and that is called Her Lady's Mouth. And we move in time a number of years. Uh, I don't know quite how many, I think about uh, three. Her Lady's Mouth. St. Rose of Lima, sophomore year. Ginny leans against the brick wall, wishing to be invisible, and watches idly as various girls cluster and disband. In the distance, across the parking lot, the younger grammar school girls and far fewer grammar school boys are jumping rope, seeing and sawing and swinging and playing Red Rover or Rattlesnake. In the foreground, Dawn sits on the cement step poking at an orange, scraping with her nails into the thick stippled skin until a patch comes away, exposing the muscly globe underneath. After dismantling the inner fruit, Dawn rises to offer Felicia the first perfect section. The two girls stand side by side, sucking at the sweetness before consuming their respective symmetrical treasures. Suddenly a bee intrudes, installs himself in the path of Felicia's breath, startling her. She hurls the coveted piece of fruit to the ground, but the bee is in every sense unmoved. It seems he does not crave the source, he craves the trace she bears and hovers imp impertinently at her rosebud mouth until dawn gallantly swats at the intruder. But even after being rescued, Felicia seems shaken. Comfort is supplied by a female knight whose shining armor takes the form of pleated plaid. Ginny is entranced by this subtle interaction, witnessed fortuitously. On a whim, she invents her own soliloquy for the knight whose name means mourning. A bee, I see, is mesmerized by my lady's mouth, and lingering in the citrus scent upon her lips, he doth persist until my lady starts to cry, then I, with all the gallantry she merits, will swat the rogue till he desist. Children across from the parking lot chant in unison, forming a human chain to suggest a snake, drowning the B and C of Ginny's homespun prosody with R-A-T-T-L-E, such that Ginny almost misses the punchline if such term applied to a sentence whose punch was as soft as a kiss. Dawn produces a tissue pristine unlike the one at Ginny's feet and tenderly wipes the wetness from Felicia's cheek as reverently as if that tear had emanated from the statue of the Virgin Mary. She then says as if the playground were their private stage, you can't blame him for thinking you were sweet. This wit suffused with tenderness is galvanizing and the unsightly tissue mortifying. Ginny nervously kicks it into the grass as close to the trash cans as possible so as to continue building her soliloquy on their behalf. Importunate bee, she recites, how dare they terrorize my lover's ruby lips. Hey, Postadella, what you fuck? Are you talking to yourself again? <laughs> oh, Darcy, it's you, she says, jolted from her illusory privacy. Haven't you got anything better to do? Kicking the dirt nervously, lest Darcy think the original gesture had been more than an idle one, Ginny replies, gotta entertain myself somehow. 
Ginny will henceforth try to keep her soliloquies internal and will not share with Darcy how impressed she is by the courage and authority with which Dawn brushed the bee from Felicia's lips, nor share the realization of how much more tender this protective gesture is than anything that transpires Friday evenings between herself and Billy, the automatic and yet tentative hibernation of their hands in each other's jeans with so few words and none of them, nor any touch, approximating the solicitousness with which her schoolmate to her other schoolmate said, you can't blame him for thinking you were sweet. There is something so mature, she thinks, about this private compliment, this profession of affection, whose implicit gravity seems as patent as the Nicene's creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. But if God created both what was unseen and seen, and if he was himself all-seeing, then how did he view that which Ginny had just seen? Was Dawn's touch to Felicia's cheek to him unsavory, as distasteful as this bloody tissue in the grass, and thus requiring two customized acts of contrition recited sotto voce by Dawn and Felicia in their respective beds on the cusp of sleep? Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for being a lesbian. Or would that creativity be blasphemous, regarded only as a means to entertain oneself, an inappropriate way to seek comfort as they steel themselves to face rejection, not from each other, such as Ginny felt was imminent from Billy, but from their mothers and their fathers and their holy apostolic church? Entertaining oneself was challenging for heaven's sake, no matter what gradation of transgression, if you were branded with a St. Rose insignia. There was bound to be this nun's objection or that nun's objection, every instance of innocent play acting subject to scrutiny, reprimand. On that same playground, Ginny, Vicky, and Maggie had once mimicked the Supremes, lining up beside one another, gesturing in triplicates, swinging their prebescent hips, singing the lyrics to Love Child, putting all their collective heart into the phrase, never meant to be unaware that on St. Rose grounds, any casual reference to a baby out of wedlock, even a proscriptive one, was as taboo as the transgression which it represented. Only later did they fully understand that by the church's reckoning, any baby in the making was a baby meant to be, to mystically. The sister on playground duty was unequivocal. This is not a proper song for Catholic school playground girls. These lyrics are unsuitable. She had not seemed to take into account the cautionary aspect. I'm sure your parents would be appalled to know you listen to such filth on the radio. But Ginny's mother always allowed her and Angela to hear WABC's Top 40 Countdown on New Year's Day, and she even left the car running in the driveway for a while after they came home from errands so they wouldn't miss a single song. This, in fact, was one of the best things about Rose, that she'd sing along with her daughters exuberantly, much as they knew she would rather duet with Renata Tibaldi or Robert Merrill, spouting passionate Italian from Tosca or La Traviata, Othello or the Barber of Seville, rather than blandly asserting, though somewhat more tunefully than her two daughters, that the worst was over and thus equating the sun with a red rubber ball. The phrasing of this mother-daughter trio was a bit sloppy, admittedly, given that the mother sang correctly, sun is shining, while the daughter sang approximately, gonna shine, but the diction of a pop song was surely more elastic than, for example, the prosody of an Andrew Marvel poem that likewise paired the images of ball and sun, and which between its lines, addressed to a coy mistress, might prefigure a love child a poem the girls would study, study later, one before the other, courtesy of Sister Catherine John. But on the playground that day, Jeannie and her partners in crime knew better than to argue the facts with the nun, always better to acquiesce, look at the ground, and say one by one, yes, sister, yes, sister, yes, sister. Because if it isn't one thing, it's another. If not songs, then shoes. If not shoes, then skirts. A pleated plaid with hem raised too high, revealing more than knee, a smidgen of thigh. A pleated plaid skirt switch for a pair of jeans in the locker room after the final bell, which despite its ding of closure does not take a girl out of the DMZ of school property, because even in the parking lot, the rules still applied. Or bad behavior, or bad intentions, or bad attitude. But what if the shoe someday were on the other foot the nuns under the girls' collective thumb. Sister Mary Agnes, Vicky, and I must report, it has come to our attention, that you have acquired a very bad habit. The girls spit out the laugh they can't control. They don't care how corny the joke is. 
Not appropriate words, not appropriate shoes. There's something between a shoe and a boot, are they not, Miss Posta della Fuoco? For some reason, Ginny is distracted by the difference between sister's Fuoco pronunciation and the way her Italian relatives pronounce her name. Ginny usually thinks it's adding insult to injury to make three syllables out of two, yielding an even longer train of a name, Fuoco. Strange the way Italians make an O so long and open, but somehow in this moment she feels the nun's pronunciation to be crude and deliberately so in comparison. It distracts her from the next phase of interrogation. Are they chuckers? Are they watches, she wants to respond, but restrains herself, dares not be fresh, though the footwear in question had never, to her knowledge, had a particular name. Is this suitable footwear, in your opinion, for the funeral of your classmate's brother, a young boy taken from his siblings and parents by our merciful God to spare all further suffering? Suitable, thinks Ginny, for poor Jimmy Mulligan. Dead or alive, he'd have little concern for her shoes or suddenly rigorously enforce school code of Oxford or loafer only, loafer into the slit of which one could flamboyantly showcase a penny. They could just as easily have called that slit obscene or ostentatious or materialist, given what a shiny coin paraded with every step might represent. That was much more logical than the censure of some innocent shoe boot hybrid. Since when was a shoe boot a showboat? What shoes had Sisyphus, about whom Sister Catherine John would lecture, to support his repetitive steps, pushing his boulder up the hill, the inverse, it seemed, of Ginny Mulligan's brief life, an eight years long episode of a broken-headed body as, as it were perpetually falling down the basement stairs, bonk, 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 his head the mythic boulder doomed to repetition, or it might as well have been no less of a fated target than JFK's. Hard to know and always too indelicate to ask if he'd been born that way or had become that way after the accident, since Laura's dad always yelled at his daughters if anyone forgot to close the basement door or horsed around by the top of the stairs saying, hey, want to end up like Jimmy? Be careful for God's sake. Laura Mulligan somehow or other damaged brother was said by the nuns to be a gift to their whole household, the same nuns who now declared it a gift that he died. Well, which is it, Ginny wants to demand? You know what I mean? After bitching to Darcy, they composed the cliff notes for their own capricious course syllabus. Lesson one, love the retard. Lesson two, lose the retard. Lesson three, review one and two and give thanks to God for these opportunities to suffer and to suffer more and to witness more suffering. Funeral shoes, how about blue suede funeral shoes? I'll stop there, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank Peter for that extraordinarily generous introduction, and <clears throat> Mary for a terrific reading, and thank you for coming. I'm gonna be reading two pieces tonight, the first a story, and the second something else. The something else is just two minutes long. I'll start with a story. People sometimes ask me where I get my ideas for stories. I disappoint them by telling them I don't know. The whole thing is mysterious to me. They think I'm lying. They may be right. I do know that sometimes I write about things that frighten me. This is one of those stories. History of a disturbance. You are angry, Elena. You are furious. You are desperately unhappy. Do you know you're becoming bitter? Bitter as those little berries you bit into? Remember, in the woods that time, you are frightened. You are resentful. My vow must have seemed to you extremely cruel or insane. You are suspicious. You are tired. I've never seen you so tired. And of course, you are patient. You're very patient, Eleanor. I can feel that patience of yours come rolling out at me from every ripple of your unforgiving hair, from your fierce wrists and tense blouse. It's a harsh patience, an aggressive patience. It wants something, as all patience does. What it wants is an explanation, which you feel will free you in some way, if only from the grip of your ferocious waiting. But an explanation is just what's not possible, not now and not ever. What I can give you is only this. Call it an explanation if you like. For me, it's a stammer, a shout in the dark. 
Do things have beginnings, do you think? Or is a beginning only the first revelation of something that's always been there, waiting to be found? I'm thinking of that little outing we took last summer, the one up to Sandy Point. I'd been working hard, maybe too hard. I had just finished that market penetration study for Sherwood Merrick Associates. It was the right time to get away. You packed a picnic. You were humming in the kitchen. You were wearing those jeans I like, the ones with the left back pocket torn off and the top of your bathing suit. I watched you as you sliced a sandwich exactly in half. The sun struck your hands. Across your glowing fingers, I could see the faint liquidy green cast by the little glass swan on the windowsill. It occurred to me that we rarely took these trips anymore, that we ought to do it more often. Then we were off, you in that swooping straw hat with its touch of 40s glamour, I in that floppy thing that makes me look like a demented explorer. An hour later, and there was the country store with the one little with the one red gas pump in front. There was the turn. We passed the summer cottages and the pines. The little parking lot at the end of the road was only half full. Over the stone wall, we looked down at the stretch of sand by the lake. We went down the rickety steps. I with the thermos and picnic basket, you with the blanket and towels. Other couples lay in the sun. Some kids were splashing in the water which rippled from the passing speedboat that made the white barrels rise and fall. The tall lifeguard stand threw a short shadow. You spread the blanket, took off your hat, shook out your hair. You sat down and began stroking your arm with sunblock. I was sitting next to you, taking it all in, the brown-green water, the wet ropes between the white barrels, the gleam of the lotion on your arm. Everything was bright and clear, and I wondered when the last time was that I'd really looked at anything. Suddenly, you stopped what you were doing. You glanced around at the beach, raised your face to the sky, and said, what a wonderful day. I turned and looked out at the water. But I wasn't looking at the water. I was thinking of what you had just said. It was a cry of contentment, a simple expression of delight, the sort of thing anyone might say on such a day. But I had felt a little sharp burst of irritation. My irritation shocked me, but there it was. I'd been taking in the day, just like you, happy in all my senses. Then you said, what a wonderful day. And the day was less wonderful. The day, it's really indecent to speak of these things, but it's as if the day were composed of many separate and diverse presences. That bottle of soda tilted in the sand, that piece of blue-violet sky between the two dark pines, your green hand by the window, which suddenly were blurred together by your words. I felt that something vast and rich had been diminished somehow. I barely knew what you were talking about. I knew, of course, what you were talking about. But the words annoyed me. I wished you hadn't spoken them. Something uncapturable in the day had been harmed by speech. All at once, my irritation passed. The day which had been banished came streaming back. Spots of yellow-white sun trembled in brown tree shadows on the lake edge. A little girl shouted in the water. I touched your hand. Was that the beginning? Was it the first sign of a disturbance that had been growing secretly? Two weeks later, the Polanzanos had that barbecue. I'd been working hard harder than usual, putting together a report for Warren and Green, the one on consumer perception of container shapes for sports beverages. <laughs> I had all the survey results, but I was having trouble writing it up. Something was off. I was happy to let it go for an evening. Ralph was in high spirits, flipping over the chicken breasts, pushing down tenderly on the steaks. He waved the spatula about in grand style as he talked real estate. That new three-story monster house on the block, could you believe two mill, those show-off window arches? And did you get a load of that corny balcony, all of it throwing the neighborhood out of whack, a crazy eyesore? But hey, it was driving property values up. He could live with that. Later, in the near dark, we sat on the screened porch watching the fireflies. From inside the house came voices, laughter. Someone walked slowly across the dark lawn. You were lying in the chaise. I was sitting in that creaky wicker armchair right next to you. Someone stood up from the glider and went into the kitchen. 
we were alone on the porch. Voices in the house, the shrill cries of crickets, two glasses of wine on the wicker table, moths bumping against the screen. I was in good spirits, relaxed, barely conscious of that report at the edge of my mind. You turned slowly to me. I remember the lazy roll of your head, your cheek against the vinyl strips, your hair flattened on one side, your eyelids sleepy. You said, do you love me? Your voice was flirtatious, easy. You weren't asking me to put a doubt to rest. I smiled, opened my mouth to answer, and for some reason recalled the afternoon at Sandy Point. And again, I felt that burst of irritation, as if words were interposing themselves between me and the summer night. I said nothing. The silence began to swell. I could feel it pressing against both of us like some big rubbery thing. I saw your eyes, still sleepy, begin to grow alert with confusion. And as if I were waking from a trance, I pushed away the silence. I beat it down with a yes, 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 of course, of course. You put your hand on my arm. All was well. All was not well. In bed, I lay awake, thinking of my irritation, thinking of the silence, which had been, I now thought, now like some, not like some big, swelling, rubbery thing, but like a piece of sharp metal caught in my throat. What was wrong with me? Did I love you? Of course I loved you. But to ask me just then, as I was taking in the night. Besides, what did the words mean? Oh, I understood them well enough, those drowsy, tender words. They meant, look, it's a summer night. Look, the lawn is dark, but there's still a little light left in the sky. They meant you wanted to hear my voice, to hear yourself ask a question that would bring you my voice. It was hardly a question at all, rather a sort of touch, rising out of the night, out of the sounds in the house, the flash of the fireflies. But you said, do you love me? which seemed to require me to understand those words and no others, to think what they might exactly mean. Because they might have meant, do you still love me as much as you once did, even though I know you do? Or isn't it wonderful to sit here and whisper together like teenagers on the dark porch while people are in the bright living room? Or do you feel this rush of tender feeling which is rising in me as I sit here at night in summer at the Polanzano's barbecue? Or do you love everything I am and do, or only some things, and if so, which ones? <laughs> and it seemed to me that that single word, love, was trying to compress within itself a multitude of meanings, was trying to take many precise and separate feelings and crush them into a single mushy mass, which I was being asked to hold in my hands like a big sticky ball. Do you see what was happening? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Despite these warnings, I hadn't yet understood. I didn't at this stage see the connection between the afternoon at Sandy Point the night at the Polanzano's barbecue, and the report that was giving me so much trouble. I knew something was wrong, a little wrong, but I thought I'd been working too hard. I needed to relax a little. Or maybe, I tried to imagine it, maybe the trouble was with us, with our marriage, a marriage problem. I don't know when I began to suspect it was more dangerous than that. Not long after the Polanzano's barbecue, I found myself at the supermarket picking up a few things for the weekend. You know how I love supermarkets. It excites me to walk down those big American avenues, piled high with the world's goods, as if the spoils of six continents are being offered to me in the aftermath of a triumphant war. <laughs> At the same time, I enjoy taking note of brand name readability, shelf positioning, the attention drawing power of competing package designs. I was in a buoyant mood. My work had gone well that day, pretty well. I wheeled my card into the checkout line, set out my bags and boxes on the rubber belt, swiped my card. The girl worked her scanner and touchscreen, and I watched with pleasure as the product names appeared sharply on the new LCD monitor facing me above her shoulder. Only two years ago, I had designed a questionnaire on consumer attitudes toward point of sale systems in supermarket chains. I signed my slip and handed it to the girl. She smiled at me and said, have a good day. Instantly, my mood changed. <laughs> 
This time, it wasn't irritation that seized me, but a kind of nervousness. What was she trying to say to me? <laughs> I realized that this thought was absurd. At the same time, I stared at the girl trying to grasp her meaning. Have a good day. What were the words trying to say? At the word have, her front teeth had pressed into her lip a big overbite. She looked at me. Have a good day, good day, have. What do you, I said, and abruptly stopped. Things became, became very still. I saw two tiny silver rings at the top of her ear, one ring slightly larger than the other. I saw the black plastic edge of the credit card terminal, a finger with purple nail polish, a long strip of paper with a red stripe running along each border. These elements seemed independent of one another. Somewhere a cash tray slid open, coins clanked. Then the finger joined the girl, the tray banged shut. I was standing by my shopping cart, studying the mesh pattern of the collapsible wire basket, trying to recall what was already slipping away. You too, I said, as I always do, and fled with my cart. <laughs> At dinner that evening, I felt uneasy, as if I were concealing a secret. Once or twice, I thought you were looking at me strangely. I studied the salt shaker, which looked pretty much the way it had always looked, but with, I thought, some slight change I couldn't account for. In the middle of the night, I woke suddenly and thought, something is happening to me. Things will never be the same. Then I felt, across the lower part of my stomach, a first faint ripple of fear. In the course of the next few days, I began listening with close attention to whatever was said to me. I listened to each part of what was said, and I listened to the individual words that composed each part. Words. Had I ever listened to them before? Words like crackles of cellophane, words like sluggish fat flies buzzing on sunny windowsills. The simplest remark began to seem suspect, a riddle, not devoid of meaning, but with a vague haze of meaning that grew hazier as I tried to catch it. Not on your life, you bet. I guess so. I would be moving smoothly through my day when suddenly I'd come up against one of them, a word snag, an obstacle in my path. A group of words would detach themselves from speech and stand at mock attention, sticking out their chests as if to say, here we are, who are you? <laughs> it was as if some space had opened up, a little rift between words and whatever they were supposed to be doing. I stumbled in that space. I fell. At the office, I was still having difficulties with my report. The words I had always used had a new sheen of strangeness to them. I found it necessary to interrogate them, to investigate their intentions. I don't mean to exaggerate. I knew what words meant, more or less. A cup was a cup, a window, a window. That much was clear. Was that much clear? There began to be moments of hesitation, Fractions of a second when the thing I was looking at refused to accept any language. Or rather, between the thing and the word, a question had appeared. A slight pause, a rupture. I recall one evening, it must have been a few weeks later, when I stepped from the darkened dining room into the brightly lit kitchen. I saw a whitish thing on the white kitchen table. In that instant, the whitishness on the white table was mysterious, ungraspable. It seemed to spill onto the table like a fluid. I felt a rush of fear. A moment later, everything changed. I recognized a cup, a simple white cup. The word pressed it into shape, severed it as with the blow of an ax from everything that surrounded it. There it was, a cup. I wondered what it was I'd seen before the word tightened about it. I said to myself, you've been working too hard. Your brain is tired. The words you're using appear to be the same words you have always used, but they've changed in some way, a way you can't grasp. When this report is done, you are going to take a vacation. That will be good. I think it was at this period that my own talk began to upset me. The words I uttered seemed like false smiles I was displaying at a party I'd gone to against my will. Sometimes I would overhear myself in the act of speech like a man who suddenly sees himself in a mirror. I began to speak less. At the office, 
where I'd established a long habit of friendliness, I stayed stubbornly at my desk, staring at my screen and limiting myself to the briefest of exchanges. It's surprising how little you need to say, really. At home, I greeted you silently. I said almost nothing at dinner and immediately shut myself up in my study. You hated my silence. For you, it was a knife blade aimed at your neck. You were the victim and I was the murderer. That was the silent understanding we came to quite early. And of course, I didn't murder you just once, I murdered you every day. I understood this. I struggled to be, well, noisier for your sake. The words I heard emerging from my mouth sounded like imitations of human speech. Yes, it's hot, but not too hot, I said. I think that what she probably meant was that she, the fatal fissure was there. On one side, a gush of language. On the other, what? I looked about. The world rushed away on all sides. If only one could be silent. In my study, I avoided my irritating desk and sat motionless in the leather chair, looking out the window at the leaves of hydrangea bushes. I felt tremendously tired, but also alert. Not to speak, not to form words, not to think, not to smear the world with sentences. It was like the release of a band of metal tightening around my skull. Always I had the sense that words concealed something, that if only I could abolish them, I would discover what was actually there. One evening, I looked for a long time at my hand. Had I ever seen it before? I suppressed the word hand, rid myself of everything but the act of concentration. It was no longer a hand, not a piece of flesh with nails, wrinkles, bits of reddish blonde hair. It was only a thing, not even that, only the place where my attention fell. Gradually, I felt a loosening, a dissolution of the familiar. And I saw a thickish mass, yellowish and red and blue, a pulsing thing with spaces, a shaded clump. It began to flatten out, to melt into surrounding space, to attach itself to otherness. Then I was staring at my hand again, the fingers slightly parted, the skin of the knuckles like small walnuts, the nails with vertical lines of faint shine. I could feel the words crawling over my hand like ants on a bone. But for a moment, I had seen something else. I am a normal man, wouldn't you say? Intelligent and well-educated, yes, with an aptitude for a certain kind of high-level work but fundamentally normal in temperament and disposition. I understood that what was happening to me was not within the range of the normal. And I felt, in addition to curiosity, an anger that this had come upon me in the prime of life, like the onset of a fatal disease. Once when I was a student and had decided to major in business, I had an argument with a friend. He attacked business as a corrupt discipline, the sole purpose of which was to instill in people a desire to buy. His words upset me, not because I believed that his argument was sound, but because I felt that he was questioning my character. I replied that what attracted me to business was the precision of its vocabulary, a self-enclosed world of carefully defined words that permitted clarity of thought. At the office, I could see people looking at me and also looking away. The looks reminded me of the look I had caught in the eyes of the girl with the little rings in her ear as I tried to understand her words, and the look in your eyes that night at the Polenzano's barbecue when I opened my mouth and said nothing. It was about this time that I began to notice within me an intention taking shape. I wondered how long it had been there, waiting for me to notice it. Though my mind was made up, my body hesitated. It would be necessary to arrange a sick leave. There would be questions, difficulties. But aside from all that, finally to go through with it, never to turn back. Such acts were not at all in my style. And if I hesitated, it was also because of you, Elena. There you were in the house. Already we existed in a courteous dark silence, trembling with your crushed down rage. How could I explain to you that words no longer meant what they once had meant, that they no longer meant anything at all? 
How could I say to you that words interfered with the world? Often, I thought of trying to let you know what I knew I would do. But whenever I looked at you, your face was turned partly away. I tried to remember what it was like to be a very young child before the time of words. And yet, weren't words always there, filling the air around me? I remember faces bending close, uttering sounds, coaxing me to leave the world of silence, to become one of them. Sometimes, when I moved my face a little, I could almost feel my skin brushing against words like clusters of tiny, tickling insects. One night after you'd gone to bed, I rose slowly in my study. I observed myself with surprise, though I knew perfectly well what was happening. Without moving my lips, I took a vow. The next morning at breakfast, I passed you a slip of paper. You glanced at it with disdain, then crumpled it in your fist. I remember the sound of the paper, which reminded me of fire. Your knuckles stuck up like stones. When a monk takes a vow of silence, he does so in order to shut out the world <clears throat> and devote himself exclusively to things of the spirit. My vow of silence sought to renew the world, to make it appear before me in all its fullness. I knew that every element in the world, a cup, a tree, a day, was inexhaustible. Only the words that expressed it were vague or limited. Words harmed the world. They took something away from it and put themselves in its place. When one knows something like that, Elena, one also knows that it isn't possible to go on living in the old way. I began to wonder whether anything I had ever said was what I had wanted to say. I began to wonder whether anything I had ever written was what I had wanted to write, or whether what I had wanted to write was underneath trying to push its way through. After dinner that day, the day of the crumpled paper, I didn't go to my study but sat in the living room. I was hoping to soothe you somehow, to apologize to you with my presence. You stayed in the bedroom. Once, you walked from the bedroom to the guest room where I heard you making up the bed. Do you think it's been easy for me? Do you? Do you think I don't know how grotesque it must seem? A grown man, 43 years old, in excellent health, happily married, successful enough in his line of work, who suddenly refuses to speak, who flees the sound of others speaking, shuns the sight of the written word, avoids his wife, leaves his job in order to shut himself up in his room or take long, solitary walks. The idea is clownish, disgusting. The man is mad, sick, damaged, in desperate need of a doctor, a lover, a vacation, anything. Stick him in a ward, inject him with something. But then, think of the other side. Think of it. Think of the terrible life of words, the unstoppable roar of sound that comes rushing out of people's mouths and seems to have no object except the evasion of silence. The talking species. We're nothing but an aberration, an error of nature. What must the stones think of us? Sometimes I imagine that if we were very still, we could hear rising from the forests and oceans the quiet laughter of animals as they listen to us talk. And then, lovely touch, the invention of an afterlife, a noisy eternity filled with a racket of rejoicing angels. My own heaven would be an immense emptiness, a silence bright and hard as the blade of a sword. Listen, Elena, listen to me. I have something to say to you which can't be said. As I train myself to cast off words, as I learn to erase word thoughts, I begin to feel a new world rising up around me. The old world of houses, rooms, trees, and streets shimmers, wavers, and tears away, revealing another universe as startling as fire. We are shut off from the fullness of things. Words hide the world. They blur together elements that exist apart, or they break elements into pieces, bind up the world, contract it into hard little pellets of perception. But the unbound world, the world behind the world, how fluid it is, how lovely and dangerous. At rare moments of clarity, I succeed in breaking through. 
then I see. I see a place where nothing is known because nothing is shaped in advance by words. There, nothing is hidden from me. There, every object presents itself entirely with all its being. Stripped of words, untamed, the universe pours in on me from every direction. I become what I see. I am earth, I am air, I am all. My eyes are suns, my hair streams among galaxies. I am often tired, I am sometimes discouraged, I am always sure. And still you're waiting, Elena, even now. Even now you're waiting for the explanation, the apology, the words that will justify you and set you free. But underneath that waiting is another waiting. You are waiting for me to return to the old way. Isn't it true? Listen, Elena. It's much too late for that. In my silent world, my world of exhausting wonders, there's no place for the old words with which I deceived myself in my artificial garden. I had thought that words were instruments of precision. Now I know that they devour the world, leaving nothing in its place. And you? Maybe a moment will come when you'll hesitate hearing a word. In that instant lies your salvation. Heed the hesitation. Search out the space, the rift. Under this world, there is another waiting to be born. You can remain where you are in the old world, tasting the bitter berries of disenchantment, or you can overcome yourself, rip yourself free of the word lie and enter the world that longs to take you in. To me, on this side, your anger is a failure of perception, your sense of betrayal a sign of the unawakened heart. Shed all these dead modes of feeling and come with me into the glory of the fire. Enough. You can't know what these words have cost me, I who no longer have words to speak with. It's like returning to the house of one's childhood. There is the white picket fence. There is the old piano, the Schumann on the music rack the rose petals beside the vase. And there, look above the banister, the turn at the top of the stairs. But all has changed, all's heavy with banishment, for we are no longer who we were. Down with it. You too, Elena, let it go. Let your patience go, your bitterness, your sorrow. They're nothing but words. Leave them behind in a box in the attic, the one with all the broken dolls. Then come down the stairs and out into the unborn world, into the sun, the sun. This is very short. This next piece isn't a story. I don't think it's even prose. The truth is, I don't know what it is. When I was a kid, I was excited when I discovered the word thingamajig. I thought it was a very fine word which could be applied to anything in the world. So I invite you to think of this piece as a thingamajig, a verbal who's he what's it's. The subject is clear enough the division of property between two people undergoing a divorce. He takes, she takes. He takes the dish rack, she takes the hat rack, he takes the table, she takes the chairs. He takes the upstairs, she takes the downstairs, he takes the front yard, she takes the back. He takes the storm door, she takes the screen door, he takes the downspout, she takes the rain. He takes the summer, she takes the winter. He takes the weekend, she takes the week. He takes the flat head, she takes the Phillips. He takes the ball peen, she takes the claw. He takes the inside, she takes the outside. He takes the upside, she takes the downside. He takes the grandma, she takes the grandpa. He takes the cradle, she takes the trike. He takes the horsey, she takes the moo-moo, he takes the wee-wee, she takes the doo-doo, he takes the chee-chee, she takes the frou-frou, he takes the hoo-ha, she takes the boo-hoo. 
He takes the oak tree. She takes the ash tree. She ta he takes the coat tree. She takes the shoe tree. He takes the headboard. She takes the breadboard. He takes the outboard. She takes the floorboard. He takes the backboard. She takes the washboard. He takes the drainboard. She takes the dashboard. He takes the duct tape. She takes the scotch tape. He takes the sheet rock. She takes the sheets. He takes the stemware. She takes the stoneware. He takes the hardware. She takes the flatware. He takes the tinware. She takes the swimware. He takes the cookware. She takes the cake. He takes Broadway. She takes Park Place. He takes the lead pipe. She takes the wrench. He takes anguish. She takes heartache. He takes fire. She takes the heat. He takes her fancy. She takes her, his breath away. He takes her measure. She takes his eye. He takes shelter. She takes pleasure. He takes umbrage. She takes flight. He takes a back seat. She takes a powder. He takes a chill pill. She takes a hike. He takes a look-see. She takes a dim view. He takes a gander. She takes a goose. He takes a snapshot. She takes a pot shot. He takes a miss. She takes a mister. He takes exception. She takes correction. He takes instruction. She takes possession. He takes over. She takes after. He takes up with. She takes off. He takes her down a peg. She takes him for all he's worth. He takes it on the chin. She takes it lying down. He takes her for a ride. She takes him to the cleaners. He takes the wind out of her sails. She takes the words right out of his ever-loving mouth. Thank you. I was told I'm supposed to stay here now. <sighs> Thank you both. Um, can we have the house lights up? We'll, we'll try and do a few audience questions. I know it's a little bit late. Um, anybody have a question for Stephen or Mary? Um, going once. Uh, maybe I'll ask one then. Um, Stephen, you said the other day uh, on the radio that uh, what you like to do in a story is swerve. You start with a certain amount of realistic detail and then you swerve and what happens next is up for your readers to decide. I, I wonder if you'd talk about uh, having just read History of the Disturbance, uh, the, the swerve in that story, um, and then what happens next. I suppose you could say the swerve, remember this isn't a, a fixed plan that I regularly follow, I just notice it in my own work in between stories when I have nothing better to do. Um, all of us, I would, I would guess, have some moments when we question words, when we're aware of cliches as just filling in space maybe not really standing for things, especially if you're trying to feel uh, express complicated feelings. <clears throat> in this story, I simply allow a man to take that farther and farther and farther until he not only loses the sense of words, but begins to think of them as hostile to what is actually there. Uh, this, this, I, I take him into what I, Stephen Milhauser, I believe, think of as craziness. Do not believe this man. I, I love words and believe that they give us the world. But when I wrote this, um, I believed in, in him. He's, he swerves as far away from me as is possible to do, which is why he scared me. You know, you hear these two together. You have his hostility to words. You have offstage his wife's hostility to him. And then you, Stephen, give us the second story, which is, you know, easy to connect as the divorce of those two mm. in the first. I think you set that up well for us. <laughs> I'll ask one more, this one of Mary, and then if, if you guys don't have any, we can go and sign some books. Um, Mary, one of the topics of conversation in the session with the students before was, um, and Stephen was talking about this um, around Edwin Mulhouse, um, how the struggle between autobiography and um, leaving behind the facts of one's own experience um, 
can be uh, in conflict that has to be resolved. You've been working on this huge novel, 500 pages, um, that has some basis in your own autobiography. Would you talk about if that has been an issue for you and how you've worked to resolve it? Well, check in after I have resolved it, but uh, it, it, has been, it has been an interesting challenge, as I was telling the students earlier, because uh, I have not previously worked in the mode of a large novel. In fact, the only novel I ever wrote was uh, a thesis novel when I was in college, and everything else has been stories and novellas, and I've always written odd length fictions, but um, at the time when most people s say, well, when are you going to write your novel? Isn't that the next step? I would always say, oh, pshaw, I have no interest in such a thing. How conventional. No, I, and then I've found it uh, sneaked up on me, but in this uh, rather, um, you know, uh, uncomfortable way, shall we say, and also to go back to childhood and adolescence and um, have that uh, become material in a concrete way was also something new for me. So um, I think that uh, the way I resolved it was, well, or am in the process of resolving it, was that for many years I thought that the only way for me to keep growing artistically was to turn to being a realist, which I had never done because I'm kind of an irrealist and a metafictionalist and whatever other bad words get associated with those unconventional kinds of modes. And, um, and it really was failing when I was doing it that way. And then I suddenly realized like many years in, an embarrassing number of years in, that I could actually continue to use some metafictional elements and irreal elements in dialogue with the realist elements, and that's when it opened up for me, and the autobiog semi-autobiographical stuff was able to find a transformation, I guess. One of the things that Peter was talking about in his intro about Stephen was um, the pitfalls of categorizing too easily. And I think um, both of you are writers, uh, try to categorize you, readers do or critics do, and um, it's unconvincing. Um, I wanna ask, you're both teachers. Um, presumably your students read your work. Um, do, you, do you find that uh, difficulty to classify liberating as, as an ethos to pass along to the students? Do the students come into the room feeling any of that toward you? You don't have to be any one kind of thing, one sort of writer. You can write this sort of story one day and that sort of story the next. Um, if you would talk about that. Mary, maybe you could go first. Um, yes, well, I, you know, one is very grateful to have uh, one's students as readers. One can't count on them being one's readers, but often they are generous enough to uh, offer that attention. And I, uh, I find that for me, the, uh, you know, to have been categorized as an experimental writer for many years, it's, it's an awkward category, you know, but I, I also appreciate it, and I also feel that I've been so lucky to teach at institutions where people are willing to think outside the box, et cetera, and where I've been for the last decade or so, Bard College is particularly a place like that, so I find that it's wonderful not to have to explain myself to my students and say, well, I know this is weird, but I'm doing this for this reason. You know, they just intuitively get it, and that's kind of marvelous. Are they encouraged, though, to, to write weirdly themselves? I think, well, I think many of them are encouraged that because that's, it's natural to them, you know, so that's what's wonderful. It's not, I, and I would never, ever, and this is for 30 years of teaching, it's always been very important to me never to uh, try to instill in my students my own stylistic predilections or my own modes. I don't, I don't teach to make people experimentalists or such. I don't believe in that. But when that happens naturally, I think that is a very beautiful thing. But I think anybody that appreciates any of the things that matter to me, like you know, love of language or musicality or you know, imagination or any kind of inventiveness, I, I really cherish that, and I find that that does happen just you know without much of my prodding because I'm lucky enough to teach students who are so much smarter than I am. About students reading your work, in the very first fiction workshop I ever taught, and I was I was over forty at the time. I had a very enthusiastic student who came in after a few weeks and said, oh, I, I, I love taking a writing course. I've never done that before. And, and you seem to really enjoy uh, teaching these courses. Um, have you ever tried writing yourself? 
And I said, uh, in, in my spare moments, I, 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 I doodle. Um, but about, about the, the other part of your question, um, the truth is students are very often um, tempted to be conventional and because they think there are, there are proper rules that they're supposed to follow. It's not true of all students, <clears throat> but, but most of them are, the very idea of taking a course like this means that you want to learn how to do something the way I would learn to be taught if I took a harmony course and wanted to learn classical harmony. So I allow them to do that, and I'm often pushing them to do something a little more edgy, rather than students, young people coming in with wild, exciting things that, that shock some doddering old fellow like me. It, 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 it doesn't quite work like that. I, I wait for it to happen. It doesn't quite happen. What about you guys? Anyone? Yes, down there. I thought you were trying to say that they should have married and lived happily ever after. <laughs> Back there. That's actually an almost impossible question. I, I, <clears throat> I, something in me, you know, respectfully resists it because I don't want to choose one part of my work over the other. A, a story, even a complicated one, not to mention something as complex as a novel, has many kinds of feeling, many things going on and interweaving. And I don't, I don't want to choose, if, if you mean something more general, like do you embrace the everyday and the familiar as opposed to the strange and, and surreal that, that direction that your story is sometimes, I say the two exist inextricably interwoven. They can't be separated. That feels unsatisfactory, but that's because I, I don't want to choose one part. You're asking me which, which of my children do I love better? I, I won't do it. Well, I mean, I guess I would agree with Stephen that it's, it's very hard uh, to choose. And I, for myself, because I try different things, I know that some readers who might love one work of mine might loathe another of mine. So it's, it's useful to see what things work for which people and that there's not necessarily consistency. And if you take risks and try different things, you know, you can't expect to please all the people all the time, which of course I do not expect uh, my work to do in any sense. Um, but I think that there is a particular eros that gets attached to certain endeavors for whatever reason. And I, I don't think I would call it quite the way you did that, you know, expresses your personality best. But sometimes I think maybe something that's more opposite your personality or seems to be a work of consummate invention or just somehow you know, captures one's own imagination and how language is able to go, you know, kind of come to you. I, for me, because that's such a rare experience, because I'm not a natural writer, and it's it's a very labor-intensive task for me. And I, I found, for instance, in a novella of mine called The Translator, which is very difficult, that it, um, it was kind of coming to me in that nat natural way after a while, like I would dream my way to the next image or uh, the next um, word in a way that made me very, very um, 
excited and, and pleased. So some, something like that I can relate to from your question. Maybe we'll take one more. Yep, over there. That, that's a complicated question. <clears throat> I, I only started teaching relatively late. I was over 40. I could not have taught, it's just my temperament, unless I knew that I was a writer. I didn't, to, to teach before I know who I am it was too confusing. Before then, I, I seized as much time from life as possible. That's what writers want, they want time. And if you're not independently wealthy, that's the battle always. Um, I didn't solve writing and teaching, but I was helped by the accident that a particular college was offering something. <clears throat> At the time, I, I was looking for work, and that was a half-time a half -time position. That's what I do at Skidmore. I teach one semester a year. And unlike some writers who do that, when I teach, I don't write. So I have eight months when I can do exactly what I want. I'm, I'm obsessive. I can't write a little bit here and there. That's how I do it. What, what writers do who have to teach full time, I don't know. I remember when I was thinking about these things in my 20s, it was my father was urging teaching as a, he was a, a, uh, a professor, a passionate one. He said, you get four months a year. Only four months? <laughs> it's, taken me, it's taken me three and a half months just to sharpen a pencil sometimes. <laughs> so a writer needs 18 months a year. But if you, if you get a big chunk of time, short of that, it's a matter, if you, if you don't have that kind of time, you're not independently wealthy or you don't have a small job which gives you time, you must, you must, set aside a small, definite number of hours, ideally every day, every other day, every Monday and Friday, and all afternoon Sunday, you must have some kind of pattern like that. And as Flannery O'Connor said, be there to receive the muse. Um, I guess I'm in that latter category of the full-time teacher, so that's, uh, that's my excuse for taking so long to work on this novel. I, uh, I can't really write during the year because my teaching is so all-consuming. I also direct a program, so there's administrative stuff in there, so that's the concrete reality of that. Um, I, I think the irony of being a, uh, a, a teacher is that there's nothing more inspiring in the universe as a vocation. And for me particularly, I've always gotten to work with amazing students and great writers, and so it's just endlessly inspiring. But of course, because those people are so gifted and so engaging, you know, it, it really can um, tire one out and there's not a whole lot of time left to, uh, you know, go home and then work on one's own stuff. So it, sometimes the sadness is that it almost becomes a hobby. You know, you feel it is like the summer, the summer job, but it's one that one w awaits very joyfully and very soon that time will be here. So I look forward to it. Thank you both. Thank you all. Again, the writers will be signing uh, in the lounge, and we're selling books as well. <laughs>